So we're calling this the panel of blasphemy. And we got four great speakers talking about those different issues. Uh, to my far right, we have Christine Shelska. Um, Christine is out in, yeah, go ahead. She is the president of Canadian, uh, Canadian. She's president of Atheist Alliance International, a great organization that you should become familiar with if you're not already. Uh, she's based out of Calgary. And next to her, we have Eric Thomas. Eric Thomas is the, I was gonna say new, yep. The, the new-ish president of Humanist Canada. Uh, and he brings a vibrancy to that group, I think, that uh, is amazing. Uh, next to him is not a relation, Doug Thomas. <laughs> Doug has been involved for many years in a local group called SoFree, Society of Ontario Free Thinkers and is the president of Secular Connection Secular. And uh, finally, uh, David Rand, uh, uh, out of Quebec with Atheist Freethinkers. So I'll start with uh, David, and uh, he'll tell you a little bit more about himself and his organization and uh, a little bit about, give you a teaser on, on what they're doing about the issue of blasphemy in Canada and, and maybe further abroad. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Since this is a uh, panel on blasphemy, sh perhaps I should start by saying, uh, call this. <laughs> um, the theme uh, I want to talk about is uh, anti-blasphemy legislation seen as a form of religious privilege. We all know that Canada has a law, section 296 of the criminal code. Am I standing too close? No? Okay. Uh, which prohibits blasphemous libel, and that many other countries have similar legislation. And we also know that all of these laws, uh, even those rarely used, are a serious threat to human rights and must be repealed. That indeed is why we're here today, to work towards ridding humanity of these vestiges of an antiquated uh, religious mentality. But what in point of fact is blasphemy? Section 296 doesn't even bother to define the term. According to Wiktionary, blasphemy is defined as uh, irreverence towards something considered sacred or inviolable, or the act of insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for a religion's deity or deities, or thirdly, the act of claiming to be a god, claiming the attributes of a deity. The first of these de definitions is open to wide interpretation. If we use terms such as sacred or inviolable to describe those qualities or values which we consider to be very important to us, then in theory we could say, for example, that rejecting evolution is blasphemy against science and reason, or that unbridled pollution is blasphemy against the fragile earthly environment on which we depend for our survival. However, we know that in practice, only religions are so pretentious as to use the word sacred systematically and thus to elevate their ideas to the dizzying level of uh, requiring legal protection against irreverence. From this attitude, we can see that the religious implicitly admit that their ideology is intellectually defensible, indefensible, for why else would they require such repressive measures to protect their ideas? Evolutionary and ecology theories certainly do not require such artificial protection. In practice, only the religious interpretation of blasphemy makes anti-blasphemy legislation such a danger for human freedom. And uh, the other two definitions, the second and third definitions I just, uh, I just read, uh, both involve some form of disrespect for the deity or deities, so we're definitely in the realm of religion here. You may have heard the adage that it is impossible for an atheist to blaspheme because it is impossible to offend a non-existent deity. Uh, indeed, if blasphemy means offending the divinity, then a person who does not recognize the existence of that divinity cannot possibly offend it. Unfortunately, that is not how the term blasphemy is interpreted today. Rather than an offense against a divinity whose existence may or may not be acknowledged, the word has come to mean an offense against a system of beliefs and even, by extension, an offense against a community of believers. In other words, blasphemy has become, in the modern day, another religious privilege, a special accommodation granted to religious beliefs and to religious believers, 
a privilege which is not afforded to other non-religious communities. And this is how anti-blasphemy legislation must, in my opinion, be interpreted and how it must be opposed. Such legislation is yet another manifestation of the egregious habit of granting special privileges to religious ideologies and to those who promote or subscribe to them. Uh, this observation is amply illustrated by another provision of the Criminal Code of Canada, which occurs only a few sections after the blasphemy part. Sections 318 to 320 deal with hate propaganda. And in there, section 319 includes a, so, uh, a number of so-called defenses which make an otherwise offensive action unprosecutable. In particular, 319.3b says, no person shall be convicted of an offense if in good faith the person expressed or attempted to establish by an argument an opinion on a religious subject or an opinion based on a belief in a religious text. This provision exempts religious discourse from prosecution, thus granting a dangerous privilege to religions, permitting them to make hateful statements with impunity. This exception is very significant, given that so-called holy books often incite the faithful to, be, uh, to hatred of or, of or violence against certain groups, such as non-believers or homosexuals or certain ethnic groups. Indeed, it could be argued that most hate propaganda is motivated by religious beliefs, so that this exception grants impunity to the principal instigator of such propaganda. Now, these two provisions, the blasphemous libel section and the religious exception in 319.3b, must be considered together as similar manifestations of religious privilege with respect to freedom of expression. The first protects religions from insult by limiting our freedom to criticize them, while the second grants religions the privilege of impunity when maligning others, even if that discourse sinks to the level which, if it were not based on religion, would be considered hate propaganda. In both cases, religion has the advantage of a privilege not granted to others. This symmetry between the concepts of blasphemy and hate propaganda, which is manifest in the Canadian Criminal Code, is very significant. Indeed, two recent developments, one on the international level, the other in Quebec, eloquently illustrate the insidious link between them. Firstly, we're all aware of attempts by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or OIC, to have the United Nations condemn so-called defamation of, religions, of religion a measure which, if completely successful, would be tantamount to an international anti-blasphemy law. It has succeeded in having several non-binding resolutions accepted, despite opposition from many nations such as Canada, and condemnation from human rights and free, spe free speech activists. These resolutions typically employ language such as denouncing religious hatred, intolerance, xenophobia, etc., while often conflating religion and race. Secondly, on June 10th, the current Quebec government, that of the Liberal Party led by Philippe Couillard, proposed draft legislation, Bill 59, whose declared purpose is, quote, to prevent and combat hate speech and speech inciting violence, end of quote. This bill would grant sweeping new powers to the Quebec Human Rights Commission, allowing it to initiate investigations on its own without having received a complaint, to receive complaints anonymously without protecting the anonymity of the accused, to suppress speech before completion of an investigation, to impose exorbitant fines, and to publish a list of the guilty on the internet. Even more disturbing is the action plan against so-called radicalization, which the government released on the same day as the draft bill. The document describing the plan makes little mention of fundamentalism or Islamism, yet Islamophobia is, replete, is mentioned repeatedly Indeed, the document uh, blames jihadist radicalization on prejudice in general and Islamophobia in particular, while not even considering the obvious cause, which is the extremist ideology of Islamism. This is completely backwards. If, if prejudice against Muslims exists, it is caused by Islamic radicalism more than the other way around. Furthermore, back in December of 2014, during an interview with Radio Canada, Commission President Jacques Fremont justified the idea of extending the Commission's powers against so-called hate speech by referencing resolutions which go in that direction adopted by the UN authorities. He was clearly referring to the various so-called defamation of religion resolutions, but without mentioning that these resolutions were from the OCI pursuing it, its usual Islamist agenda. It must not be forgotten that the current Kuyad government came to power by defeating the previous PQ government, which introduced a charter of secularism. Probably the best secular legislation ever proposed in any Canadian jurisdiction, and which was at the center of the election campaign. 
The most controversial aspect of that charter was a dress code for public servants while on duty, a dress code which very reasonably limited displays of partisan religious affiliation, just as Quebec legislation already limits displays of partisan political opinion in the public service. That is, it removed a religious privilege. The Charter of Secularism was defeated by a de facto alliance between multiculturalists and Islamists who together denigrated the Charter and its supporters in ways very similar to the language used by the OCI resolutions. The privilege of blatantly displaying one's religious affiliation while on the job in the public service was of course rebranded religious freedom in the distorted vocabulary of Charter opponents. The Liberal Party of Quebec rode that wave of anti-secularism to the fullest and got themselves elected with much support from fundamentalist Muslims. They are now paying these allies back by blaming jihadist radicalization on so-called Islamophobia rather than, than on Islamist propaganda and by implementing what promises to be in practice a new anti-blasphemy law at the provincial level. Our organization, Atheist Free Thinkers, is a participant in the Rassemblement pour la Laïcité, or Alliance for Secularism, a coalition formed in 2013 to support adoption of the Charter of Secularism, and currently the RPL is preparing a brief to be presented at the National Assembly in Quebec City, a brief which is severely critical of Draft Bill 59. I believe it will be on September 22nd that the brief will be presented. In conclusion, the criminalization of blasphemy is a problem which cannot be solved in isolation, in my opinion. We must look to, at a bigger picture. Uh, we must recognize that anti-blasphemy laws are a manifestation of religious privilege, and that we must fight against such privileges at, at all levels and in all, all contexts. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Doug Thomas, and I'm the president of Secular Connection Seculaire, which is a natural, national organization that sole purpose of existence is to lobby governments to correct inequities in uh, the kinds of things we're talking about here in terms of blasphemy and those kinds of things. Um, we regularly uh, write letters to the Office of Religious Freedom, encouraging them to take a more balanced approach to uh, abuses of uh, free speech and theists, um, and we, we will continue to do that. Um, in this particular case, when we're talking about the blasphemy legislation, it's a, I'm very pleased that someone's brought this to the fore because it is such a representative piece of the kind of religious entitlement that is embedded in so many of our institutions. And Sandy Donaldson earlier today referred to the idea that when you speak out against that religious entitlement, you're accused of being anti-religious or that you're removing their human rights. And that's a common reaction to us, by the way. Oh, you don't want us to sing the national anthem. You want to take the religious words out of the national anthem. Well, that means that you're denying us the right to be religious. No. What we're saying is that there needs to be, in a diverse culture like ours, even a multicultural culture, a place, which symbolically could be considered a round table, where we can all come to the table and speak equally about things of common concern. And I really don't think that a municipal government that's considering where to put a new sidewalk or how big the diameter of the sewer should be has to have a religious reason for doing that. I guess, obviously, sewers downstream of churches may need to be larger, but that's another <laughs> matter. <clears throat> so, when we look at things like the blasphemy law, and, it, and by the way, I don't think the bla any blasphemy law has been used since sometime in the 1930s. So it's not something that's in our face, which is, frankly, one of the problems we have in Canada is we live in this, oh, look, folks, compared to the rest of the world, we live in Disneyland if you increase the minimum wage and added health care benefits. So we are not really constantly enervated, as our friends to the south are, by 
theists in our faces. Um, I, my, one of my favorite stories, and I hope it's apocryphal, is a person manning a Salvation Army donation kettle in a mall someplace in the state. And the per person came up, made a donation in the kettle, and the person said, Happy Holidays, instead of Merry Christmas, and got punched out because it's Merry Christmas, you know, which, as far as I can tell, has absolutely nothing to do with anything of the re Christian religion, but that's here and there. So when we look at these things like blasphemy laws, and, and uh, David mentioned Section 296 and Section 319.3b, um, first of all, it's, it's when, when I, and, and I'm sure David's had this experience, and probably Eric and Christine as well, when you talk about this in front of an audience, you can hear people's eyes glazing over. I mean, it's just like, well, this is not exciting stuff. Can't you go burn a church or something? <laughs> you know? Unfortunately, it, it's, it's the, what we have to look at and realize that it's these little things. And it's important for us to realize that this, we're, Brian calls, or David called it religious privilege. I call it assumed entitlement, right? How many times have you heard Christians say, but Canada was built as a Christian country. It's on Christian principles. Well, I'm sorry, but when the first Christians landed in Quebec in 1608, they immediately declared that the Aboriginal spiritualism and established culture was savage and beyond repair and needed to be replaced. Uh, forgetting, of course, that back in France, where they came from, they were still burning people at the stake for believing in a different kind of Christianity than you needed, not some other religion. And they continued that for 200 years, and when that didn't work, when Aboriginals still had beliefs and language and whatever, they kidnapped their children and threw them in the residential school. I'm sorry, that's not the Canada that I think I want to inherit or that I want to carry on with. So for me... For me, this kind of religious entitlement needs to be checked at the door. Uh, and it's, it's amazing. When I was a high school teacher, I walked into a Meyer District Secondary School, and that's just north of here, and it's kind of in the Bible Belt. So I, it was in December. I can't remember the exact date, but I had to walk into the school halfway and realize partway down the hall, they're playing Christmas carols. They're playing the first Noel in a public high school. Oh. So I went to the office and I said, um, I don't think it's appropriate to play religious music in the hallways of our school. And the head secretary said, well, we've always done it. <laughs> Argument ad antiquitatum. <laughs> and uh, it's what everybody wants, assumption of popularity. And <laughs> it's a very good secretary. She did a wonderful job, but it was just, it was all clear. So I finally said, no, I'm sorry, but you cannot do that. This is a public high school. And those of us who are non-believers in the school would really don't want to have religion forced upon us. So it got to the point where it escalated, and I ended up writing a stock letter. I'd written a few of them before to the principal, quoting the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal and so on and so forth. And uh, two days later, the Christmas carols were gone, but so was every other kind of music gone. And uh, staff members said to me, nice work, Thomas. What? Well, they're telling me that you said you can't play music over our, our uh, PA system. Oh, I didn't say that. I said they couldn't play hymns. And they said, well, can't they play Walking in Winter Wonderland, you know, uh, Jingle Bells? I said, sure. The Christian administration that's school assumed that that was Christmas music. Okay, I had to disabuse them of the fact, and you may or may not know this, but Jingle Bells was actually written for, new, for um, American Thanksgiving. Go figure. Uh, at any rate, we restored the, the good music. But it is uh, just that kind of assumption and entitlement that these laws, whether they're enforced or not, reinforce. And when we write to another one of the Commonwealth countries, 
And for American visitors, Canada is still a member of a big group of nations called the Commonwealth of Nations, the former imperial victims. You opted out of that benefit a few years ago, and you know, too bad. We gave you an opportunity in 1812, but you just <laughs> surrendered. I mean, geez. At any rate, uh, we, the, pro the problem is that when we go to our fellow Commonwealth countries and say, wait a minute, you can't go uh, beating up Bangladesh, being one of them, and I write the High Commissioner in Ottawa, oh, but you have anti-blasphemy laws in Canada. It's normal. It's a part of the British heritage. That has to stop. And that means that we have to actively look at these bits and pieces of symbolism in our country that they're embedded and stand up and say, hey, we need to change that. We need to make sure the round table includes everybody, including us, including us atheists. So we need to end that entitlement. Thank you. In thinking about what we were going to do today, the thought occurred to me that I wasn't nearly as smart as the two people that were going to be before me. So I decided that my role should be one of um, pugilist. Um, so rather than be really smart, um, I purposely set out to piss you off. Um, and I have ex-wives that laugh like that when I say that. <laughs> I am as mad as I can get over this issue. This is, my notes here are going to be a simple call to action. I hope to make you feel guilty. I hope to make you feel revulsed. I want you to take up this issue with me with the intensity you would have if you were drowning. Consider this. If your family, your mother or spouse, was being persecuted, raped, etc., what would you do? Or someone was whipping your spouse for speaking up, what would you do? Or killing your father with a machete four times since the spring in Bangladesh, and your leaders offered no justice. I'm quite seriously mad enough to yell at everyone about this issue. Are we mad enough together to commit to help each other as global citizens around the world to get rid of blasphemy laws. How can we have a respectful conversation if I cannot speak my opinion? It's not a conversation, it's you proselytizing. If our conversation is governed by only what you want, and I just shut up and listen, how does that show respect for each other? Don't care about me, I got an ego. How do you get respect from me if you don't listen. Um, there is hope. Earlier this year, I'm going to speak quickly here because this is a bit long, so if you listen fast, I'm going to, sp I'm going to talk very quickly. So li listen fast. Earlier this year, I'm thinking it was February, CFI, Humanist Canada, Association de Humanistes de Quebec, uh, a couple others decided to, AAI, have a, uh, an initiative to start an international coalition against blasphemy laws, henceforth called ICABEL. Uh, very soon, within a week or maybe two, we got a hold of and talked to the IHEU in London. They said, geez, you know what, that's a great idea. As a matter of fact, we're just about to launch a website to do just that. Within two weeks, we had a charter in multiple languages, one page long. Sounds pretty cool. International calls, Iceland, Turkey, New Zealand, Greece, the United Kingdom, the United States, I don't know about you folks, but I don't talk to those places quite regularly. It's incredible. Now, today, there are 200 signatories from around the world who are calling from this to, for the end of the blasphemy laws around the world. 200 international participants. And I am going to get to the part where you get to be, to be part of it. Absolutely incredible. It's, a, it's, a <clears throat> it's about time. Here, this week, literally three days ago, the IHEU out of the United Kingdom and ICAVL press release from Wednesday. Tell me if this sounds like rhetoric or a 200 group, group coalition that's pissed. They are demanding action by the government of Bangladesh. And I paraphrase for brevity. Stop 
victim blaming. This is a fact of life in Bangladesh. Government response is grossly inadequate and highly negligent. That's got some bite. And from Andrew Copps in the IHEU president, here is what he said, and I hope you feel this. There has been a tremendous outpouring of grief globally. I'm starting to tear up. This is ridiculous. It's, it's not right. So is this enough for you to commit to helping people around the world to get rid of blasphemy laws? I suspect it is. Who's in the back row? Wave your hand. See? Yes, it is. <laughs> so don't, you don't have to write this down because you're smart and you'll figure this out. And I'm going to read this section very quickly. What can you do? What are you going to do? Um, support the groups who are taking up this issue and showing you leadership by joining them as a member. Put out your money. Join Secular Connection. Join the HQ, Le Pensée de Libre, and join AAI. And if you're really good, join Humanist Canada as well. Or only. <laughs> Join a local secular humanist group and insist on this subject being discussed right now. Right now, not next week, right now. If there's a group in the neighborhood, start one. We can show you how. Blog your damn fingers off. Was that blasphemous? <laughs> Blog your damn fingers? Was it? They're atheist fingers. So we're okay. And here's a good one. I've done, I did this four years ago, and I'm going to do it again this year. Tell your member of parliament candidates, all of them, regarding Bill C-9296, how important it is to you, to Canada and our global community. Uh, sign up for the e-news at Humanist Canada, which will keep you abreast of what's going on. Attend an all-candidates meeting during the federal election. Ask for a position statement from each and every candidate. Write a letter to your editor of the paper. Copy your Facebook posts, or ours, or theirs, or hers, or yours, to your personal page, so every one of your friends knows this is important stuff to you. Go to a local atheist humanist meetup. Tweet to the world and your followers, if you have more than two, like I. Ask a minister or a priest or a rabbi for their support, because they should be just as concerned about this issue as we are. Write Ambassador Andrew Bennett of the International Office of Religious Freedom about this issue and how it's important to you. So listen, this is getting long, and I, I promise to sit down and shut up. But Here's the deal, are you still mad? Are you getting ready to fight as if your family is being butchered? Is your child living in a country that has a blasphemy law? Mine are, and they're aware that I stay up late at night and will use my last ounce of energy from this very day to fix this thing. They have seen my tears when an honest person in Bangladesh is murdered. Their family, all of us, want the law against blasphemy abolished, and so do we here. Join us today. We will be fixing this in the near future. I want your help. I want you to be able to say, I helped get rid of the blasphemy law in Canada and around the world. Thank you for your revulsion of this reality. Thank you for channeling what you're going to do when you leave here to an action item. Thank you for joining our global community, but most of all, Thank you for doing the right thing for yourself and our global evolution. Thank you. We'll do this together. Um, that's a tough act to follow, those three. And um, um, yeah, you pissed me off when you didn't include me on the list of intelligent people on the stage. <laughs> I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And, you know, righteous anger is a good thing. It's a great catalyst for change. Um, uh, it's very important that we don't become complacent here in Canada. And I want to talk about um, the international context and how those laws have um, obviously severely been um, imposed to abuse people and even kill people. And, you know, we've heard about Raif Badawi. We've heard about the uh, bangers hacked to death in Bangladesh. Um, at Atheist Alliance International in 2013, we started an asylum project to help um, people who are in that situation. And I hope you're not superstitious. We started it in 2013, and we've had 13 requests for assistance, and they're all from Muslim countries. Uh, three are in hiding and have been for several years. One's in Afghanistan, one's in Pakistan, and one's in India, and they're still being threatened. 
Uh, one fled to Syria during the Civil War, and he's been in Turkey since then trying to make a living in a context where there's millions of other refugees. There's a family from Pakistan who's now legally, um, sorry, illegally living in Malaysia um, after they were re declined refugee status by the UN. There's a secular blogger who's trying to leave Bangladesh with his young family before he becomes the next victim. There's a young woman in Saudi Arabia who cannot get a passport without her father's permission. There are two people living in Muslim countries. One has already spent time in jail for being a non-believer. Um, and they are both trying to keep a low profile. Both want to leave, but they cannot get visas to travel outside of their countries. Uh, there's one who decided to stay in his country and work with other non-believers. And we have a couple of success stories. Um, one from Gaza, who is now living in New York, and a male in Saudi Arabia who's now living in the USA. Um, so it's a very difficult process to get um, refugee status. First of all, you have to get a visa, and uh, that has to be approved, obviously. And sometimes it's a case that documents are falsified, so it's difficult to, to um, um, I guess that's a context where, where that kind of thing is particularly monitored, right? Um, we have a couple of options here in Canada. Now, the Atheist Alliance is a US-based organization, even though we're international, we have um, members as well as our board from all around the world. One of those options is a sponsorship agreement holder. And we are actually working with CFI in Canada to um, help us with this, along with some other organizations. So in order to qualify for that, an organization must be legally incorporated and sign an agreement with the Minister of Citizen Citizenship and Immigration here in Canada. Um, also, the refugee must be recognized by the UNHCR. Um, sorry, I hate acronyms. United Nations um, Human Rights Commission. Oh, sorry, United Nations. Can you help me on this? United Nations. High Commission for Refugees. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> And um, another option is that as Canadian citizens or permanent residents, if you're over the age of 18, you can um, get together in groups of five and agree to sponsor uh, a, a refugee or asylum seeker for about a period of a year while that process goes on. And you agree to emotionally and financially support that person. And uh, it also requires that you either live or have a representation, represent, representative in the settlement area. So we're asking your help for those. If you can, if you have an organization that be, can become a sponsorship shareholder agreement, um, please participate in that. And if you can um, get together in a group of five, please contact Atheist Alliance International, and we will help you find a candidate to sponsor. And um, I think, sorry, somebody okay. Um, so internationally, we continue to work with other organizations to help with these cases. We've referred some to the Progressive Atheist in Australia. And uh, Human Rights First successfully helped one person with the paperwork and the application process. And we're also going to follow up with the UNHCR for refugees on why these cases were refused their status. So this is an issue that we all need to get on board with. Again, I want to reiterate that we as Canadians cannot be complacent because these laws can be abused even in a peaceful um, country here. And um, I've often heard it asked at conferences, what can we do to help? Well, here's a real way to make change in people's lives. So I hope you will consider either if you have an organization to help us out with a sponsorship holder agreement, or if you belong to a group, or if you can even just get some friends together in groups of five, I think you need like $12,000 to, to sponsor that refugee, please do so and um, help change lives and help make this world a secular world. Thank you so much. Please uh, line up for, for questions that you may have for any of our panelists. Uh, if it's a question specific to one panelist, uh, please name them, or just maybe an open-ended question to, to all of them. Hi, my question is for Doug Thomas. Um, uh, speaking as someone who went through the Ontario public school system in the 1980s, just as my school board was transitioning out of 
doing a, a, a prayer recital in the morning just after the national anthem and uh, really subtly promoting Christian views uh, exclusively through the schools. I, I saw that transition, so I want to thank you for speaking out against the Christmas music and hymns playing through uh, the hallways in Elmira. Um, my, I have two questions for you. Uh, first, do you think that your actions subsequently made that school principal more selective in hiring teachers who were non-believers um, in order to avoid quote-unquote problems and therefore actually led to greater homogeneity within the, the school? And my second question is, uh, do you think the response of removing all music from the, uh, from the, from the PA system was uh, a, a subtly veiled attempt at, at making you look bad? You know, oh, he made us take all the music out rather than just the Christian hymns. Thanks. Um. Don, I, I just have to actually speak in it? Okay. Uh, I'm from Elmira. I'm not used to these things. The, uh, I'm not, I don't have any real way of identifying whether there were problems with uh, other non-believers getting jobs in the school, but the hiring process in the secondary school system, at least in this region, uh, is so blind followed, I guess, in the sense that it's, it's, there's just a number, many people who make the decision about who's going to be hired and certainly they can't really ask you up front whether you're an atheist or not. And so I'm not sure. I mean, it's obviously possible. Uh, it's hard to tell with that particular principle. Um, it, it's possible that she was trying to make me look bad. Uh, if that was the case, or that were the case, sorry. She uh, it backfired because I got a tremendous amount of support from, from people who said, okay, that's what she did well. You know, thank you for speaking up, and that's a good thing. And, and by the way, a lot of the support came from Christian teachers who said, you know, it's, it's just not right that we should be playing Christian music in this school because there are all kinds of other people. So this was, I think, pretty much a thought. It's that sense of entitlement that's just there, and they exercise it unconsciously. I don't think they even think about it. Um, and, you know, when we talk about the national anthem, people say, What? There's the theism in a national anthem, you know, like they just, um, it's amazing because you, you see all those thousands of people standing and singing the national anthem at sports events and whatever, and you think, is this, you know, words going from the piece of paper to the PA system without going through the minds of anyone? I don't know. It's just, but, but I, so I'm not sure. It could have been, uh, if it were, it backfired. Uh, just a question for all the panelists, I guess, to have a word on. Um, internationally repealing blasphemy laws is undoubtedly a, a great thing, but given that a lot of what we're seeing, a lot of the negative uh, response is mob justice, justice, it's mob reaction to perceived blasphemy, will repealing these laws have the effect uh, internationally that we might desire, given that it's the religious people in these locations taking it on themselves to enact mob justice, especially in like Bangladesh and so I'd love to answer that question. Um, the answer is, the one thing it will do is it'll stop them from um, suggesting that the fact that Canada has a blasphemy law is permission for Saudis to whip and kill somebody. They've said, we have a blasphemy law, but so does Canada. Hello? We don't kill people. We haven't even used it since 1930. But it's being used, so that has to stop. So if it's a mob mentality, probably, particularly in the, in the organizations that are 90% something, in Bangladesh, it, it's a hodgepodge. It's a mess. And we have to, to help them get on with their democratic life. Mob? Absolutely. Sure. But you know what? I don't want them to blame us. There's a, there's a value in being on a little slightly higher road. Iceland's done it. They did it with the Pirate Party starting in January of this year. They repealed their frickin' blasphemy law. Iceland, go figure. <laughs> so we can do it too, and they won't, can't blame Iceland anymore. Hi, right, first, just, thanks just, uh, just to before, all of the... Just, just before you well, ask an echo, a very quick comment on this. When we look at a problem like this that is so worldwide and so seems so large and undaunting, and we just say, oh, what can we do about that? You know, 
It all starts with the individual. It all starts with you going to a candidate's meeting in the next, how many years is this election going on? This, <laughs> in this hyperbolic Harper election, you know, go to the candidate's meeting. Ask them, what's your party's policy on Section 296 of the Criminal Code? Now, guarantee, I can almost guarantee you two things. One is the candidate know, know what you're talking about. <laughs> Brian, uh, Thomas Mulcahy didn't know what the person was talking about when they asked him. Uh, number two is that if enough of us start doing that, the question is going to get some momentum, but we all have to do it. You have to write your member of parliament. And I've had people say, well, I write my member of parliament, and he never answers. Well, of course he's not going to answer, but it's like a vote. It's going into their little polling system. Their minions are going to know about it. The reason that there's that really obnoxious preamble on our Charter of Rights and Freedoms is that a whole bunch of Christians got together and wrote members of parliament and got a pile of letters there so Jean Chrétien was able to go to Pierre Trudeau, who didn't want to put it in there, and say, hey, look at all the letters we've got in favor of it. If they can do it, we better learn how to do it. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for all the wonderful th work that you guys are doing. Um, my uh, question is part question and part comment. I'm originally from Pakistan, and personally, I know a lot of people who have been stuck by the blasphemy laws. And the article number is 295C. And it didn't occur to me that it has something to do with the background that we were part of the Commonwealth as well. The British were ruled by the British Empire until the David mentioned the article 285 to 296, and I see the similarities, and I was like, wow, I didn't knew that history. So uh, I would like to understand what exactly was the purpose behind those putting those blasphemy laws in the first place. Were they meant to just keep the local subjects at peace, as a, using religion as a tool to control the masses? Uh, I mean, obviously, they, they were... Uh, the British Empire were, were not that religious. I guess they were just, just a colonization technique, right? So I just understand, uh, I would like to know a little bit about the history. Okay, if, if I may. The, uh, the British, and I'll say the English because I'm Welsh and I don't want to take any of the blame for this. <laughs> <laughs> the English had two methods to control their empire. One is they did everything in base 12. So while people were trying to figure out what the hell five pounds and six shillings was, they marched in and took your city. Uh, <laughs> the second thing they did was they brought the Church of England to the colonies. The only legal church in Canada, Upper Canada, and in the Maritimes was the Church of England. So, for example, Laura Ingersoll and James Secord were married by the Justice of Peace, because they were Methodists. They couldn't get married by church. Just a little piece of history of trivia. But yeah, the, so they, it was out of that that, of course, then you, you, you the theism, the, the so-called, what we think is separation of church and state in the modern um, British Commonwealth countries. And I'm not sure how valid that comment is when our head of state is also the head of the Church of England. But that was... It was, if, if you were commenting, making irreligious comments, in effect, you were commenting on the crown itself, which in the English mind, uh, the Welsh were often of different minds, <laughs> often at the same time, they uh, basically, you were insulting the king or the queen. And so, yes, so the blasphemy laws, was, it, was part of, it was part of that whole integral package. Uh, and yes, a lot of the laws uh, that were transported or transformed right over to the colonies. And not even the United States changed the Constitution that much. If you look at the powers of the President and the Senate and the House of Representatives, they're exactly the same as the powers that George III had and his House of Lords and his House of Commons in 1775. It's astounding. But they just, yeah, they just lifted it. And the country's like... Uh, Pal uh, Pakistan and so on, which were later conquests. Um, and uh, yeah, so very much it's that. And it's 
precedent. And countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh and, and other British colonies cite that precedent as being, it's part of, it's because, and that's why we need to really change and be, uh, take leadership in this commonwealth and say, hey, we need to, we need to stop this in Canada and by influence hopefully uh, chip away at theirs. Well, gentlemen and uh, lady, uh, you have actually brought us good news today. Well, you're, there's a lot of anguish and anger and concern. The message really is good news. Just go back 10 years and think in, in, your, in your mind 10 years ago, not necessarily specifically about this subject, but where the humanist atheist movement has been in the last 10 years and what has happened. In the last 10 years, we've had a flood of information on, in terms of books, podcasts, uh, conferences. Uh, this conference didn't take place until last year. What's happening, quite frankly, is we're reaching a, a stage where the message is getting out and, and religious um, uh, organizations are on the defensive like they've never been before in our history. And, and part of it, of course, is the internet and part of it is the social uh, network. And I have to thank one of my friends, Charlene, for getting me back involved in Facebook. I didn't particularly like Facebook until I got back on it and talked about this issue. And so, can you imagine if each one of you on Facebook, look at all of the people here, commented back on this issue and many other issues and how many friends you're going to contact. I thought I was going to get all kinds of blowback for talking about atheism on Facebook. I got to tell you, I haven't had one blowback yet. The world is changing, and you folks are doing it, and you folks are doing it, and you have an enormous amount of power. You sit here, some, some individual, especially the ones that are here for the very first time. And I, as people were coming by and talking to me, I asked, have you been to a conference before? No. There's a lot of people here who have never been to a conference like this before, and there's good reason. These conferences never existed before. You have, as an individual, a lot of power in your own hands. Use your social media, and you'll be amazed at just a little comment where that goes to all your friends. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank you very much for that, uh, that those words. I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that goes back to the question that was asked prior about the mob mentality and how we can overcome that. I think when you remove the type of legislation that exists in some, some of these places where it's being clearly abused, uh, you know, clearly some of these acts are against the law, like killing people. And um, I think that serves as a mechanism to turn a blind eye to bad behavior. And if that mechanism is taken away, then there's more power to A, um, punish the people that are doing these horrific things, and B, for the rest of the world to put pressure on these countries that are allowing this stuff to happen. So um, let's create our own mob and uh, let's, let's get rid of this, yeah. this stuff. Hi guys, um, so I have a question, part comment, part question as well. It's kind of related to the second and maybe third question that um, these guys asked. Um, so I'm originally from Singapore, and um, like Canada, was a British colony. Um, we too have this blasphemy law that has been a vestige of, of the British Empire. Um, it was used for the first time this year um, against a 17-year-old boy who was a blogger. He was thrown into jail for insulting. He made a, our great leader die, the, the first Prime Minister of Singapore, and uh, Lee Kuan Yew, he was considered the greatest statesman of, of, of modern Asia. Um, and when he died, he made a very critical uh, YouTube rant video. 
in which he uh, compared the supporters of Lee Kuan Yew to the supporters of Jesus Christ. And for that, he was charged with blasphemy, 17 years old, and thrown into jail. Um, he served about a few months in jail, and, and now he's out. So in effect, it seemed like um, he was charged with harassment. I don't know how you harass a dead person, um, but that, that happened. And, and he was also charged with the blasphemy law because of the supporters. If he had not made that comment about Jesus Christ, um, that, that he wouldn't have been thrown into jail. They eventually dropped the harassment law, but he went to jail specifically for, for blasphemy. But in, in this country, like in other cultures in Far Eastern Asia, um, you can repeal, even if you try to repeal the blasphemy law, you have a culture, a, a collectivist culture. And people will self-censor in a collectivist culture. So I feel like it's useful to sort of target it top down, you know, from the legal standpoint. Um, but how do, you, how do you change the culture? How do you change it bottom up? It's, it, you're right, it is a vestige of culture, and it's a vestige of cultural history. A hundred years ago, 1500, when the law was written, we were all either Presbyterian or Catholic or, or Protestant or some frickin' religion. Today, not quite so much. Today, you're right, the collectivism rules. Yeah, Today, and, and most people aren't paying attention. Well, the Welsh guy is. <laughs> but the, to your point is that the collectivism, we, we don't need to worry whether it's top down or top out because the religious folks are dying off. They're going away. The Church of England has said maybe 15 or 20 years. The United Church, an hour, maybe two. <laughs> but it's, in, it's inevitable that those folks are going to be gone. And I personally feel angst for them because they've been wrong for so long. But they're going away. Anyway, the, the whole point is, to your point about collectivist, collectivism? Collectivist, yeah. Collectivism. <laughs> collectivism. It's, it's, it's a cultural reality for our future. These folks, these folks prove it. Our exponential increase, the uptick in our Excel spreadsheet with humanists is pushing 50%. Wow. And we're trying to convince some of the members of parliament right now they better pay attention to us. So yeah. I think Doug's got a good point. Go to your members, go to your meetings. Say, listen, Atheist 101, what do you think? <laughs> and I'll further add to that, you know, um, again, on the point of legislation and taking away that legislation, yeah, maybe people will go kicking and screaming into um, reality, and we're gonna, we're gonna drag them. Yeah. We're gonna drag them, yeah. Kicking and screaming. Thank you. Quick comment from the Welsh guy. Um, the, the, the mainstream churches are what we in Canada like to refer to the mainstream churches, are certainly fading. The, the fundamentalist religions are, have stayed stable at about 11% of the population for some time, and it's projected they probably will, because they have that nice simplistic message that, you know, believe A and you're going to get B, right? Um, and they, they may be the, the hurdle, but the, the point is that I did say 11%. So again, uh, politicians um, listen to votes. And so if some of the major church leaders realize, okay, we, if we take a strong stand against removing these laws, and they, a lot of them aren't even aware they exist, by the way, um, then, then again, in culture, how do you change culture? You do that through social media, you do that through um, all these things, but you've got to make that uh, effort at it. You know. Thanks. Um, so you're basically saying that we are an enforcement act away from a Raif Badawi situation here in Canada. Is that what it is? I mean, it's not going to be 10 years and a thousand lashes, but we are an enforcement act away, literally. So that's, that's one part of my question. The other part, can I ask the panel to blaspheme out on record here? <laughs> and I can ask all the uh, members, the, the people around me here, to blaspheme if they so wished. Uh, just since we're already The law requires the blasphemous law. libel. So you can't just swear, but if you, if you have some libel in there, you could... Well, you could it shouldn't be a problem. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Jesus Christ is a lie. If you're, if you're delusional by yourself, you can get medicated. If you're delusional with a friend, you have a new religion. Uh, somebody, somebody told me that uh, the difference between a sect and a religion is that the people who run a sect know that they're lying. And the people who found sex, rather, know that they're lying, and the people who found religions are dead. Mohammed loves ham sandwiches. Oh. Uh, made from female pigs. Yeah. be much younger than nine years in pig year, right? So my question kind of comes from the standpoint of tying social deviance and fighting blasphemy laws. I think that um, most often if you identify as an atheist, uh, and even more so as a secular humanist, you're a deviant in society. And many textbooks still include the atheists and discussions about atheism from the standpoint of social deviancy. So I want to know, in terms of um, many of the suggestions you've given today about fighting blasphemy laws, how identifying as an atheist or a humanist um, and your association with certain groups and organizations might impact your ability to fight blasphemy laws. You only have to be right. <laughs> and you're right. Blasphemy's got to go, period. Mm -hmm. It's like having a discussion with a religious person. Do you believe in that? Then we're done. I, I don't need to go to the, book, to, to, the, to the diatribe about the book, book with the plus sign in the front. I don't, I don't need it. Do you believe in this? Yeah, well, then we got a problem. We're done. Same with, the, same with your point. I'm not being flippant at all. But mm -hmm. the point is, no, you're, you were right. And, there's, and there's, no, there's no charge for that. Just stick to your guns. And we'll be fine. Deviant or not. Uh, I'd, like to make a, I'd like to make a suggestion. Mm -hmm. I think we should um, make uh, liberal use of the word atheophobia to describe prejudice <laughs> against atheists. I like that. I think, we should, I, I think we should use it whenever we encounter prejudice against atheists. We, we should also make it clear that we're not trying to shut others up. For example, when, when people accuse somebody of Islamophobia, that's telling them to shut up. We're not saying shut up, we're saying justify what you're saying. Where, where do you get off saying that atheists are less moral uh, than, than anybody else or that there's no meaning in our lives or whatever nonsense they say? Deviancy intended right here, amen, amen. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, hi. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, first of all, um, minus more of uh, comments and, and a little bit of a question at the end. As a Bangladeshi, I would like to thank you for bringing what's happening there um, to light to the people. And as you know, like four murders in um, this year alone, it's been and uh, I've had the privilege of knowing a lot of the bloggers and I also translated some of the work of uh, some of the people that got killed. Um, like uh, the second person that was killed, his name was Washipur and uh, translated one of his works and it got published on the website of the International Humanist and Ethical Union. So. Um, And um, I would like to thank you especially because um, I have also tried to help people get out because the situation is pretty desperate. And like the fourth guy, he was actually being followed uh, one month before his murder. And he went into a police station and they didn't really help him out at all. He just gave him like a fortune cookie advice. He said, for your own safety, it's really, it. now we advise you to leave the country and that's all they did. And it's not that simple to just leave the country because, like you said, a lot of people falsify documents and it's really hard to get a refugee status. And the third guy that got killed, I wrote an article about him. He was actually supposed to go to Sweden because he was invited by the Swedish pen and his visa got rejected. And 
if he was actually there in Sweden as a guest of the Swedish pen, um, at the time of his murder, he wouldn't be in the country, so maybe he would still be with us. So he was appealing his um, rejection to the visa, and um, the before the de decision got, uh, um, they arrived at a decision about the appeal, um, uh, he was gone. So I wrote an article about that as well. So, um, so thank you, and I think the thing you mentioned about people getting together to uh, sponsor refugees, any, we, any way we can to like get them out because the situation is really desperate. I also helped, um, and, and while we are talking about the need to repeal blasphemy laws here in Canada, I think you would all agree that in some places there are more dire consequences to these blasphemy laws than in Canada, and obviously Bangladesh, I think, I don't know if you all know, like in 2013, a lot of the people uh, Bangladesh um, arrested a lot of the people that are on the list, there, there's a list of like 82 bloggers that are like targeted. And though the list is kind of redundant because there are a lot of aliases, because a lot of people write with false names for their own safety that are repeated. But I would say not all the people that are in danger are on the list and the list is growing all the time. Like I only started speaking out um, since uh, um, January after Abhijit Roy got killed, uh, after Charlie Hebdo, and in February Abhijit Roy got killed, and I was like, you know what, enough is enough. I need to yes, like say yeah. something and come out. And obviously it came at an expense of my safety, and I translated the works of people they were trying to silence, and basically so the whole, whole world could see it, so that probably pissed them off. <laughs> so, um, But you're here now and talking now. Yes, I am here, and um, going back to my country might not be I, I don't know, I don't want to talk about it, but anyways, so, <laughs> anyways, so, the thing I was saying, and yeah, so it, it is very important to try and get them out of the country, but, um, so, I, uh, and the question, last of all, like, uh, we were talking about mom mentality and all that, um, in countries like these, like Bangladesh and Pakistan, where it's very unpopular for the government to like repeal the blasphemy law, or even like the Bangladeshi government, even someone as well known as Abhijit Roy, he was a he was an author. His books were very, his book, uh, two of his books were the the virus of faith, and um, the other one was the philosophy of atheists, like trying to get people to, yeah, these were the books that didn't sit well with the Islamists at all, and. And he was also one of the first guys that actually started like, what I would say is kind of like the atheist republic of Bangladesh where all the atheists could get together and it was the first time where they found out, oh wow, we're not alone. So, so he was a huge loss for us and irreplaceable, but um, you know, his legacy will live on. So um, even in a, someone as well known as him, the government has not made a single like um, public statement because it's really unpopular and like there are, are a huge number of, and I think one of the, one of the speakers pointed out Hippolyte, the coalition, Miss Hippolyte, yeah, sorry, I, I, I hope I got the name right, <laughs> that there's a correla correlation between um, like poverty and um, education and uh, religiosity. And as you know, Bangladesh <coughs> is a very poor country and uh, the literacy rate might be somewhere around 50%. So a lot of these people are like blindly faithful and if the government is gonna lose a huge voter base, if if even if they just say, even if they condemn the murder of the atheist, so the government has not said anything like publicly, or ha hasn't even condemned the murders um, publicly because it's very unpopular. And so yeah, my question was in, in places like these, what can we do from the outside to like try and influence like um, blasphemy laws, uh, influence like the, to um, get the government to repeal blasphemy laws and things like that. Cause, um, oh yeah, I was saying like, sorry, I'm all over the place, but the consequence, one of the consequences of the blasphemy law in Bangladesh is like in 2013, a lot of bloggers were arrested and at that time there were huge rallies by these Islamists and they just said, we want everyone that you have arrested to be hanged simply for speaking out. And there was a, there was a huge, huge rallies of like a thousand people and I actually helped one of the wives of the jail bloggers translate something and it was published on the Daily Beast, and uh, Faisal couldn't be here, he's a, he's a good friend of mine, and he has helped us out tremendously, he, him and the Global Secular Humanist Movement, and also movements.org, they're doing great work helping us out, so, yeah. Faisal's you, awesome, and so is yeah, Global Secular Humanist Movement and movements.org, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna thank you for those words. Um, 
Um, sometimes I get on Facebook or on Skype, and occasionally I will get personally contacted, and I can't express um, how terrified some of these people are and um, how heartbreaking it is and how helpless I sometimes feel. So um, join an organization. Help us out. Um, there's so many people that can't speak. Be grateful for your freedom of speech and use it. Um, yeah. yeah. I, it is frustrating. And I, we get the constant sense that we're working from the short end of the lever. And we have a government that renamed it, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade Relations. They're just as much interested in doing business with Saudi Arabia, yeah. who we sell military vehicles to, and Bangladesh and Pakistan as they are in any kind of human rights. So part of it is, <laughs> folks, we have an election. Um, it, there is no magic wand. It's going to take years, but, you know, you can't. It'll never, it'll never happen if we don't start. Yeah. And we have to start with our freedom of speech in Canada, with our ability to go to our elected officials and say, hey, we don't like this, and try to get many more people to say it. So okay. that's all we can do, but that's what we need to do. Yeah. I would just like to end by reiterating, uh, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'd just like to end by reiterating like the importance of trying to help the Bangladeshis um, get out of there, because um, when I wrote my last article about the third person getting killed, I was like, this will continue, and it has never felt that wrong to be right about something. And and a lot of people, were, there was Ramadan in the middle, so Muslims are fasting. And so they took a break during that time, you know. It's, uh, it's kind of problematic to, you know, <laughs> that much is uh, exertion when you're fasting. So after that, just like clockwork, you know, they started one more. So uh, after the fourth one, I was just numb to it. But I'd just like to end by reiterating the importance of helping these people out because they are in, uh, in a very desperate situation. So thank you. Thanks. <laughs>
that he has the right because that's in his religious, the, what he thinks is the gospel or what he thinks is true or what he, uh, the ideas he gets from that, he thinks he's, he's right. And unfortunately, he might just get away with that, with 319, 3B in place. So ideas, not people. And that's, uh, um, but again, you know, legislating, you can't legislate respect, folks. I'm sorry, you can't do it. And so all you can do is protect people's right to freedom of speech. I'd just like to add another example of, uh, of religious hate speech. Uh, recently, I heard of at least one example from the United States, maybe two, where a Christian pastor called for death for all homosexuals, I believe. Uh, and that's a clear case where it's uh, an incitement to violence, an incitement to genocide, and it, therefore it is something that, that should not be allowed, but unfortunately probably would be allowed by Canadian legislation, which is supposed to protect against hate speech because of that exception in 319.3b. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, it's not really a question, but it's just to uh, add a bit to the necessity to get, help people find refuge in Canada and how to, you know, the importance of fighting against uh, <clears throat> stupid laws because uh, I know this uh, blogger from Bangladesh. He had five attempts on his life, five attempts. Two of them almost killed him. I asked him, I said, did they ever catch the people who attacked you? He said, yes. And they put me in jail with them because he had spoken against Allah. And so he was arrested, they were arrested, and they were all put in the same jail at the same time. So we got to do something. Just a quick question to uh, to follow up what the, uh, the I didn't get his name the translator I just uh, talked about um, I was actually contacted by a young gentleman uh, I'm assuming it was a gentleman you can't really tell on Facebook um, but um, from I believe it was from uh, uh, Iran and he said he was being um, he was being uh, basically followed and harassed and um, what, what do you do like is there something that can be done in that situation where I could maybe forward uh, the information or pass it on to somebody or have him contact somebody else I'm like, I was at a loss I didn't know what to do or who to direct him to and it seemed I mean it seemed legitimate but it's hard to it's hard to, to tell yeah, um, I have a booth over there, and I have cards, and if you'd like to take a card and you have a scenario like that, please drop me a line, and, and we'll uh, put it through our project. Okay, Thank great. you. Thank, Thank you. you. That's a good point, Greg. One last quick, one last quick question. Yeah. Uh, do you know any religious groups that oppose blas blasphemy laws, or that would be with us? I, I haven't asked them. Crusade? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a bunch of group uh, of the two hundred org 200 organizations on the ICABL, there are a whole whack of religious groups who support the end of blasphemy laws. Some of them actually want, it's marketing, but they, they want to have a conversation. It's proselytizing, but they want to have a conversation. Apparently they believe in it. <laughs> Thank you. And, so, and some of them know it's going to protect them too, right? Yeah. Well, I knew the panel of blasphemy uh, was going to be good, and uh, you really delivered. Thank you very much for a warm welcome, a warm hand. <laughs> Can anybody tell me, either on the panel or in the audience, is this this is true? Um, you mentioned it was mentioned a couple of times that uh, the last time the um, anti-blasphemy law was enacted in Canada, it was like 1930, uh, but wasn't it attempted in the 80s in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, regarding um, Monty Python's Life of Brian? Is that true? Yes, it didn't go anywhere. Right. 
Okay. The law is somewhat self-disarming. In the, the first, it talks about bl blasphemy, libel, and then in the second clause in that 296, it says uh, that you can't be charged if you adventure an opinion for religion. And I'll cede to Sandy Donaldson's in legal interpretation of that, but it seems to me that it would be very difficult to prosecute someone if they just said, well, that was uh, that cartoon I drew of Muhammad with, you know, the the poor hot dog sticking out the side of his mouth. Uh, it's just it's just my opinion that he, might, you know, and I I don't know how you'd argue that, but I it, I think there's part of the reason it hasn't been enforced is one is that it's not really a very popular thing, and secondly, I think Crown attorneys are a little edgy about whether they'd actually get a conviction. Um, and they're stubborn, but they're not stupid. So, you know. <laughs> I would argue that attempting to ban Monty Python is blasphemy, but. <laughs> uh, so, thank you again. <laughs>